and welcome to our latest Money and Equality special. I'm Francine Lacroix and we'll be taking a look at the pandemic's impact on financial services. We'll delve into the data and some of the reasons behind the drastic drop of women in the workforce. We'll also get the views of two very senior women in the industry on creating an inclusive environment, retailing talent and the future of work. As part of our New Voices London event, I spoke to Julia Hoggett, Chief Executive Officer of the London Stock Exchange and Tina Lee, Chief Executive Officer of Deutsche Bank UK and Ireland. I became an investment banker in the 90s at a time when it was still legal to sack people for being gay in the UK and I already knew at that stage that I was and I remember swiping myself through the barrier on the second day after I'd got my ID card and thinking I leave the real me on the outside and I pick her up on the way home. Whenever gender diversity was brought up for a good 10-15 years of my career I ducked it. I was, I don't, don't ask me to do anything. But actually, after a while, when you look around and then you do realize, well, if it's not going to be me, who is it? <laughs> who is it? <laughs> but before we get to the panel, let's go straight to Bloomberg's Danny Berger, who joins us with the numbers behind the unequal consequences of the pandemic. Thanks, Francine. Mm. Look, if we care about the economy in a post-pandemic world, then we have to care about the harsh economic reality that women face. Layoffs have hit women harder than men, and forecasts from cities suggest that ultimately 31 million women have faced job cuts as a result of the pandemic, and that's nearly three times the rate for men. And this isn't just a matter of inequality. It mounts to real economic losses. One trillion dollars wiped off of global GDP from this alone. The financial industry at the same time isn't immune from this inequity. 10,000 fewer women now work at the biggest UK banks compared to 2019. And that is about 3% of the workforce compared to 2.1% loss for men. These uneven results are really consistent across individual banks, be it Standard Charter, uh, that retain roughly the same number of men. And then there are also banks like NatWest that saw an especially stark divide, Francine. So, Danny, are there any clear drivers that have resulted in this disparity? Well, there are two sides to this. When you're talking about the global picture, for example, more women tend to work in sectors that have been harder hit by the pandemic. They're more likely to be caretakers and do that unpaid work. But when it comes to the financial sector, there is one universal truth, and that's that it has nothing to do with ambition. This isn't a cohort looking for an excuse to leave the workforce. For women, whether they have young children, whether they have older children, or whether they have no children at all, these survey results consistently show that they have more ambition than their male counterparts. And this sur survey here is courtesy of women in banking and finance. So when it comes to the financial institutions themselves, it might be them that has to solve this pro problem. A higher portion of women than men see barriers to realizing their career aspirations, which is shown in the yellow here. At the same time, a lack of opportunities was the top reason for dissatisfaction at work. Even though women in the survey asked for promotions and pay at the same rate as men, despite long held assumptions that they don't lean in. So even before COVID created new barriers, women's lived experiences hadn't matched their demands and aspirations. Francine. Thank you so much, Danny. Now, what can companies and executives do to make up for this? Well, I asked Tina Lee and Julia Hoggett what steps they're taking to hire and retain female talent. I think we're pretty good at hiring. Mm particularly at the junior level, every institution tries incredibly hard to get a good gender balance at the intern level and at the graduate level. I think the real challenge is what happens once they get into an organization. Mm. And, and, and certainly what we see, and I think it's aligned actually across the industry, is we lose women at every corporate title. Yeah. It's not necessarily because they, they're leaving to have children, they leave at VP, they leave at director, they leave at managing director, so that by the end, you're left with a, a relatively small cohort versus what, what you started with. So I think as an industry, we have to do much better in terms of not only identifying talent, but most importantly, nurturing talent at those critical phases, and particularly at the VP level, where mm. there are hundreds of VPs thousands of VPs um, and, and how do you make sure that you've identified and nurtured that talent and, and give them the right voice when quite frankly there's an awful lot of people all vying for, for, for position. 
But should you nurture, do, or you know, do you nurture female talent differently to, to male talent to retain them? We have always, well, we always used to focus on more senior women. What we've tried to do is now build in those processes actually right from graduates all the way through because I think that's really the, the key because by the time you get to managing director or you get to a senior group I think as, as, as Julia said there are so few relatively few um, that actually we want to keep the women that we spent so much time and effort identifying right at the beginning of their careers mm. um, and and also when women leave they don't necessarily leave to have children they leave to go to the buy side. They leave to go to a consultancy. Increasingly, they leave to go and set up their own business. Mm. So, so we're competing with talent, not only initially, but also in terms of actually ensuring that they actually stay within our organizations. The difference I think now is the structured intent. Um, absolute acknowledgement that it needs to be addressed and a recognition that just doing the same thing over and over again is, is unlikely to produce a different outcome and how we need to reframe the conversation and rethink about it. Um, one of the things I say very regularly when I talk about diversity and inclusion in the city is that we absolutely need sponsoring and mentorship programs for women. Um, I slightly worry about some of the language we've used in that we've almost described them sometimes or they've been framed as special measures requirements because women need mm. these, this support in order to succeed in the workplace. Men have had mentorship and sponsorship programs in the workplace for time immemorial. It's just we don't call them that. We just call it the management. And, and so the reality is that we need to slightly reframe the way we have this conversation so that organizations understand the tweaks and the changes that they need to make. It's very easy to run the risk of thinking that you're running a meritocracy, which is actually simply a mechanism for maintaining the status quo whilst making yourself feel better about it because most meritocracies actually reward the traits and characteristics of those who are already at the top. And so unless you rethink what characteristics and traits you need, it's hard to actually change the mechanism for progression. But how, so how do you change it? You know, th there's a lot of bias training and things like that. Does yeah, any of I mean, that actually work? I think it requires more fundamental thinking of what, what do we need? What are the actual characteristics and traits and requirements that we need at the top? Women and men bring different things into a room. They bring different forms of framing. They bring different life experience. The more diversity you have in a room, so long as it is appropriately included, not just diverse, but actually feels included in the conversation, the better your answers are going to be because you don't have groupthink in the same way. Mm. But it requires organizations to reframe how they think about that value and what they think their meritocracy is serving. Um, and I think that's how you unlock the real change in in progression. We unsurprisingly have mentoring programs and sponsorship programs but, but also what we've tried to do and what we intend on doing given the fact we now have some um, even more ambitious targets with, with regard to what we want to achieve by 2025 is actually to become far more granular because I think in the past we would look at our stats on a quarterly basis, on a semi-annual basis and it was always a look back and, and in spite of our efforts, we were sort of puzzled as to why we hadn't quite moved the dial as much as we felt we were moving it. Whereas actually, what we want to do is be far more granular. So in other words, look at things on a month by month basis, look at our hiring stats, look at our lateral hires, look at our promotions, look at the way we identify talent, and really be far more granular so that we are able to course correct or when we actually look at a pool of, of individuals, we can see whether, you know, why is the data showing us this? Mm. And try and drill into it before it becomes history. Um, so I think that's something which actually we haven't done before. Mm. And I think becomes quite important in terms of trying to avoid this idea that we're looking back at the end of the year, mildly disappointed that we haven't quite made the progress that we were sure we were going to make yeah. in January. And there is a desire, which both from the management board and actually all the way down, of linking gender diversity targets to compensation. And that's not a bad thing. That would because work. Because it focuses mm -hmm. people's yeah. minds. So my balance scorecard has a gender diversity metric on it. And it's totally appropriate that it should do.
Coming up, the pandemic has changed the way we live in so many ways, but how will that impact the way we work? I think even those institutions that have said, we want people back in July, you actually find their messages a lot more nuanced. There's a great deal of flexibility that senior leaders in the city have always enjoyed, but it's very often been hidden flexibility. More from our panel next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Money and Equality. I'm Francine Lacroix. Now we're focusing on what the future of work will be in a post-pandemic world. Will it be hybrid, increasingly remote roles, or will employees be forced to come back into the office? My personal belief is that it is hybrid, but it is not one of those things where you say it has to be exactly the same answer for everybody. Um, people want to work in the office for different reasons as well. They want to do so for collaboration. They want to do so if they're more junior members of staff to learn from those around them. It's much harder to do that sort of synaptic stuff when you have to create a meeting to do so. Um, and so I think it's about what are we using office working for? If we're using it for a meeting that we could just as effectively have over Zoom or Teams, then maybe we shouldn't actually be coming in for that meeting. If it is to come up with innovative, collaborative new ideas, put teams together that wouldn't otherwise rub up against one another to come up with a new way of thinking about a problem, that's a really good use of being in the office. Mm. Um, I don't believe it's a good use of being in the office to say that it's so that I can keep a better eye on my staff. That is what good leadership and good management is about. Mm. And, and people should learn how to do that remotely or in the office. I think even those institutions that have said, we want people back in July, you actually find their messages a lot more nuanced um, around their need for real, their desire to reduce real estate, for example, and, and what they mean. So, so I think it does depend on the role. So, so th there are so many infrastructure roles, there are so many support roles that individuals simply don't have to come into the office every day. And I think particularly for global financial hubs like London, like New York, where so many people have long commutes, actually there's a productivity issue as well um, and, and, and a work-life balance where, whereby if those individuals don't need to spend one and a half, two hours traveling, they can be more productive. Mm -hmm. So it really, I think, is around being quite structured over the types of roles that people have and giving people that flexibility whilst maintaining the ability to collaborate. There has been some remarkable democratization, actually, um, that everybody was on the same, in the same, occupying the same real estate, actually the same square box of screen. Um, mm -hmm. More people could attend meetings and be in the room than might have been possible before, which was a really useful thing for training newer members of staff to give them exposure that they might not otherwise have had. There are some brilliant things that I think we've realized. We don't need to get on planes quite as often to have client meetings for two hours, you know? There are a lot of things that have changed that we need to harness and take advantage of as a consequence of this. Um, the issue is how you capture the good and, and, and still move back to a hybrid way of working. Mm. The worst case scenario is that we go back to some form of presenteeism, mm. where that is about presence in the office to suit the boss, not presence in the office to suit the employee. Mm. Um, and I don't think we're going to be able to go back to that as employers, but that is a, nobody quite has figured out what, what that's going to look like. But the organizations who get that right will be the ones that are attractive to women and men going forward. And, and being honest, I mean, something that you were saying is, is if there is a senior female that has to do the school pickup, mm -hmm. say it because, yeah. Yeah. because it's accepted, Yep. right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and, and it is that, that, that is the thing about COVID actually, that I've, I've given various speeches to lots of senior exec teams over the course of, of, of COVID. And the lovely thing of seeing ex-co's of major investment banks and seeing children come in and the odd cat okay. climb across the screen etc but the realization that everybody's human you know we all have a shared humanity and there is not this separation and an ability to talk about that need for that flexibility more I, I think uh, we've discussed that actually there's a great deal of flexibility that senior leaders in the city have always enjoyed but it's very often been hidden flexibility and actually the important thing is that you talk about it and you talk about the fact I'm, I'm leaving now to go to the gym because I, I need to for my own peace of mind so that other people realize it's possible. 
Um, and you, one of the things you realize, I think, as a senior leader is, is your behavior is being observed and it is being followed mm. as the model to follow. And if you're not actually revealing that much about yourself, you're sending a, 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 not a very clear message about how you actually operate in the workplace. I, I always think that the challenge is really going to be that over the last 15 months, we've had, everyone's been very ad hoc around working from home. So even the people that we've had coming into the office, mostly, if they're not coming into the office five days a week, have decided, oh, well, I'm gonna come in on a Monday, I might come in on Wednesday, I'll come in on Thursday. It, to Julia's point, if hybrid working is really going to work, not only for our organizations, but most importantly for our people, mm. that has to be much more structured. Um, you know, which means that you know, our tech guys are saying, actually, Monday, Wednesday, Friday doesn't really work for us. We want to come in as a team. You know, so that might be more a week in, week out. Whereas other individuals are far more, you no, know, I need to know what days I'm coming in so that we can make sure that the juniors have the right level of support and mentorship and apprenticeship that they expect and deserve, whilst at the same time we're getting the benefits of collaboration. Coming up, the importance of role models in the workplace. What steps is the financial services industry taking to promote diversity and inclusion? I became an investment banker in the 90s at a time when it was still legal to sack people for being gay in the UK. And I already knew at that stage that I was. And I remember swiping myself through the barrier on the second day after I'd got my ID card and thinking, I leave the real me on the outside and I pick her up on the way home. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Money and Equality. I'm Francine Lacroix. Now, the pandemic has dealt the financial industry's efforts to increase diversity and inclusion a severe blow. But how do we move on from this and regain the momentum of progress? According to Tina Lee and Julia Hoggett, it's about harnessing the power of female role models within the organization. Role models matter. Um, that, that phrase that it's hard to be what you can't see. Um, and I certainly know from my career, it, it's the number of female role models around me through, at, at really critical points that have made me feel I could take on the next challenge. Um, the first team I joined when I went to JP Morgan, the boss of the team was a woman and the number two was a woman. So my framing understanding of investment banking is there's absolutely no reason why women can't mm. lead. And I'm sure that that took me a long way into my career before I actually started thinking of it as an obstacle. Um, but I think it also matters that role models are visible in terms of understanding the nature of what they're role modeling. So one of the things that worried me when I came back into the city um, as one of the most senior female MDs on the floor um, was that I'm an openly gay woman who has two kids, but I took two weeks off for the birth of my son and two weeks off for the birth of my daughter. The biggest risk was that young female analysts coming up through the system would look at me and go, actually, you're the reason I can't get there. Because if it takes that structure of family life to get there, that's not the one I want. And it made me realize I had to then talk much more about my experiences, my life, so that something resonated. And I didn't become the thing that wasn't possible. I became, actually, I can take a bit of her, a bit of her, a bit of her, a bit of him, a bit of him, and turn myself into, that's the role model of how I want to progress. Mm. But it, you, you have to go past your comfort zone in how you, I think, talk about your own experiences and how you engage with staff to be a really useful role model in that regard. Yeah. I think it took me quite a while, actually, mm. to, to reveal more of myself as a, as a human being. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the sense that because I think, I think any, anyone that actually is starting investment banking, male or female, you buy into the idea of the meritocracy mm. totally and it's all about talent and it's all about the best of the best and, and that's how you're going to get from, from A to Z and, and, and you buy into it. And therefore this idea that you are different, almost you want to just go into the slipstream of, look, if I'm good enough, I'll make it and that's it. Yeah. Um, so whenever gender diversity was brought up, for a good 10, 15 years of my career, I ducked it. I was, I don't, don't ask me to do anything. But actually, after a while, when you look around and then you do realize 
well, if it's not going to be me, <laughs> who is it? <laughs> do, do you remember what, what the trigger was for you? Was it a conversation or someone, you know, where you decided to, to reveal a, a bit more about yourself? Well, actually, funnily enough, I think it was because I had my very first 360 degree review. And it was something, you, you know, the, these 360 degrees, you, you go, oh, no one's going to ever tell me anything I don't know. And mostly, you know, 90% of the stuff, but there's always 10% that you go, okay. <laughs> and that 10% was, we think she's very nice beneath the surface. Oh. It would be quite nice to see a bit more of her. And at first I was like, oh, that's ridiculous. But actually it's sort of, percolated through and I was like oh okay but sometimes that can be a bit daunting as well do, um, do you remember Julia the time I mean was there a time where you weren't comfortable speaking about m mine was a slightly different experience so um, I became an investment banker in the 90s at a time when it was still legal to sack people for being gay in the UK and I already knew at that stage that I was and I remember swiping myself through the barrier on the second day after I'd got my ID card and thinking I leave the real me on the outside and I pick her up on the way home. So I had this absolute sense of exactly that separation that Tina's talking about. Mm. Um, and then you realize you spend so much of your life at the office. Um, colleagues trust you with information and you're not sharing an equivalent amount of information with them. And there becomes an iniquity of trust actually. Um, and that felt increasingly uncomfortable. But I was actually invited to come out by my MD. Um, I had had some surgery, I was in hospital, she very kindly came to visit me. And whilst I was dosed up on morphine, I um, introduced her to my partner. And about three days later, when the morphine wore off, I suddenly realized I'd outed myself at the office. Um, and she came to visit me for my end of year review. Um, and in a time when investment banking structures of progression were very clearly yearly delineated and said, we think we may be promoting you a year early, but very great congratulations. But if you are promoted to associate, we're going to evaluate you not just on what you do for the team, but what you do for the wider organization. And then she took a perfectly timed beat and she said, have you thought about joining the LGBT society? Now, I can be dense on occasions, but I'm not that dense. And that was a gold-plated invitation to come out and to participate in the society of the organization and to do so with my management's blessing. So I then did. Um, I took that lead, um, organized one of the first ever LGBT dedicated recruiting events in the city. And from that point on, have effectively had a platform to talk about these things. Um, but it required that trigger. and. The way I think about that story is actually, it is a supreme act of management mm. and management of a human being. Um, one minute of her time changed my life, I think, because I don't think I'd be sitting here today if I had had to go through the effort of covering mm. and not being me and leaving the real me on the outside in my professional career, because you want to be able to go at everything full bore. You want to be able to not have to worry mm. about any of that cover um, and I have had the freedom to do that as a consequence of, of her actions and I'm eternally grateful um, but it is that act of management that I take the greatest lesson from. Julia Hoggett, Chief Executive of the London Stock Exchange and Tina Lee, Chief Executive of Deutsche Bank for the UK and Ireland there. Now I spoke to them as part of the New Voices London event to discuss the opportunities and risks for both women and organisations post-pandemic. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Money and Equality. This is Bloomberg.